Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah 53. If you don't have a Bible, we always have Bibles from the left hand to the right hand side. You walk in and you're free to take a Bible, a Bible with you. We always want to have the Word. It's so important to have the Word. And uh, praise God for just this time that we can come on this Resurrection Sunday and worship. Amen? Amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord today. And uh, so good to be here to share God's word with you. Um, how would you save the world? How would you save the world? I mean, I think there's a lot of people would say that they would have different ways they were going to save the world. And a lot of people would say, uh, I just need a little bit more power to save the world. But God, he chose to save the world through a humble, suffering servant rather than a glorious king. It says in Matthew 20, 28 that just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Amen? See, this idea is, is contrary to human pride and, and worldly ways. But God often works in ways that uh, we don't expect. And uh, so I want to look at um, this whole idea of the suffering servant this morning. It's found in Isaiah chapter 53, verses 1 through 3. And I'm just going to quickly work through this whole chapter with you this morning. Jesus, uh, he was the innocent servant. And he died in the place of the guilty. You know who the guilty are? <laughs> We're the guilty ones. And I, I would like to say that, you know, that I can explain everything about the cross. But this, this seems clear to me, that Jesus took the place of guilty sinners. And that Jesus paid the price for our salvation. Isaiah 53, 1 starts off with a, a very simple question, who has believed our message? It's a prophecy. And it was between about 701 and 681 B.C. And this prophecy was actually fulfilled some 700 years later, about 31 A.D. Um, I'm sorry, we're just kind of adjusting this mic, so it's going up and down. But, but what is this message? I think if you look in Romans 1, 16, it's pretty clear. It says, for I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. I think Christ is the message. Because it is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. And then over 2,000 years later, there still seems to be this great chasm between what we believe, you know, what we say we believe, and the way that we truly behave. I mean, think about Jesus. I mean, here he was, the Son of God, very, very much man, very much God. And he's and it says in John 12, 37, that despite all the miracles and, and the signs that Jesus had done, most of the people didn't didn't believe him. And that was what Isaiah prophesied. He said, Lord, who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his power for harm? Jesus said to all of these people that were gathered around, you believe because you've seen me. And then he goes on to say, blessed are the ones who have not seen and yet believed. And I have to believe that, that when he's talking about the ones that yet, yet believe and not seen, I have to believe that's us. You know, that's us. I'm thankful for the word of God because it says these things have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that believing you may have life in his name. Amen? Amen? Yet, people still refuse to believe, don't they? People still refuse to believe. And, and uh, I believe that there's possibly some people that, you know, are not for sure about this whole Jesus thing. <coughs> this Jesus who came in flesh and blood God. Who came and died on a cross for our sins. Who was buried. And three days later he rose from the grave. Amen? Amen. But that's okay. I'm not afraid of your questions. 
But I'm also sure that God's not afraid of your questions. He can handle it this morning. Amen? If you have questions about Him. It says in Isaiah 53, 1 and 2, it says, And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. And, and there's this contrast between the arm of the Lord. And when you think of the arm of the Lord, you think of, of mighty power. And when you go to the root out of the dry ground, you think of weakness. Okay, so there's this <coughs> power versus this weakness. And you know, when God made the universe, um, it says that it just used his finger. Can you imagine that? It, it said that when I consider the heavens, the works of thy fingers... That the Lord just kind of like did this. Isn't that amazing? That's how powerful our God is. That's how powerful our God. And it says that when he delivered Israel from Egypt, it was by his strong hand. But right here, to save lost sinners, and by the way, that may be an offensive term, but it's true, lost sinners. We've all been there. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But, but to save lost sinners, it says they had to bear his mighty arm. And this mighty arm that he's talking about in Isaiah, it's Jesus. It's the Messiah. It's the arm. It's the power of God. And it was on the cross that his arm was bared. You know, it's kind of like just like, you know, like just putting your arm out there saying, hit me with your best shot. My arm was bared. It says in the second verse, it says, my servant grew up in the Lord's presence. And this servant, he's talking about this prophecy that he's talking about is God. That God becomes man. He doesn't lose his divinity, but he becomes man and, and he grows up. And it says that he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. And, and Jesus did not come as a, as a great tree or, or anything great. He came as a tender plant, a little shoot. That's, that's kind of what Jesus was. Uh, Jesus, he was born into poverty. In Bethlehem and he grew up in a carpenter shop in despised Nazareth and because of his words and works Jesus attracted great crowds but let me remind you about Jesus there was really nothing about his physical appearance that made him different from you and me and it didn't make him any different than any other Jewish man it says in verse 2 that he has no stately form of majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. Now, now there's not many people in our society that deliberately try to be unattractive, right? Not in modern society. I mean, it's all about physical beauty. I mean, it, it's amazing how many times they'll, they'll use somebody's, I guess, a body, a beautiful physique to, I mean, they'll, they'll use them to sell something, you know, like toothpaste. Like, I don't understand why, why they do that. But, but you've got to remember this, that Jesus succeeded without it. <coughs> it wasn't about his physical appearance. He was just like everyone else. Once they understood what he demanded of them, how did most people treat the servants? It says in verse 3 that he was despised. When Jesus began to talk about his message, the message that he proclaimed, people despised him. It says, and they forsook uh, and, and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hid their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. They treated Jesus as any other slave. They despised Jesus. They rejected him. I mean, a cheap price was paid for him 30 pieces of silver it says that we turned our backs on him and we looked the other way when he went by see the prophecy is fulfilled on the via della rosa think about it when jesus was walking down the road carrying the cross the prophecy in isaiah is fulfilled as he's carrying the cross and people are turning their backs on him some are spitting on him. Some of, them, some of them are crying. Some are weeping and sorrowful. But they were ashamed of him because he didn't represent the things that were important to them. Wealth wasn't important to him. Social prestige, reputation, being served by others and pampering yourselves. 
See, Jesus' message was something like this. Those who are the greatest among you should take the lower rank. And the leader should be like a servant. And when he began to talk about this kind of a message, it bothered them. Because they wanted to be served and not to serve and I believe that this message that Jesus puts forth, I mean, it's that Jesus is still rejected today for the same reasons. We reject Jesus because we'd rather have wealth. We'd rather have social prestige. We'd rather have a good reputation. We'd rather be served by others and, and pampering ourselves. And then we, we look down here in verses 4 through 6. We talk about the smitten servant. It says, surely our griefs he himself bore. And our sorrows he carried, yet we are ourselves esteemed him smitten, stricken, I'm sorry, stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced, which in other words is wounded in the New King James Version, through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And don't, don't go over this too fast. He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by a scourging, we are healed. And all of us are like sheep. We've gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has caused, the Lord has planned, the Lord has purposed from before time that all the iniquity of us would fall on Jesus. And this is the heart of the passage. And it presents the heart of the gospel message. And it's all about this innocent servant, this innocent man, his name being Jesus, becoming a sacrifice for our sin. This message was at the heart of, of Israel's religious system because they would take an innocent animal and, and they would sacrifice it for the guilty sinner. In 1 Peter 2.24, he, and it means Jesus, and it means Jesus, he personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be healed, to, so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds, you are healed. Jesus bore our sins on the cross. In the verses 4 through 6, there are these plural pronouns, our griefs, our sorrows, our iniquities, our transgressions, everything that you've ever done wrong, everything that's, every wicked thing that's in your life, our griefs, our sorrows, our iniquities, our transgressions, we have gone astray, we have turned our own way. He didn't die Jesus didn't die because he had done something wrong. He died because of what we did. He died for our sins. He was wounded, it says, which means pierced through. His hands and feet were pierced by nails. His side by a spear. He was crucified, which was not a Jewish form of execution because they would stone people that were Jewish. That was the capital punishment. But on the cross, Jesus Christ was bruised. And this word bruised, it, it means crushed under the weight of a burden. Have you ever been under a burden before? Have you ever felt a real burden? Anybody with me this morning kind of burden for someone or burden? But I want you to think about the burden He's carrying. What was the burden? It says, all of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us have gone astray. Each of us have turned to our own ways. And here's the burden. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Everything past, present, and future fell on our Savior over 2,000 years ago. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Sin. Sin. It's a burden. And that burden grows heavier 
and heavier and heavier and heavier the longer that we resist God. In Psalms 38, 4, it says, my guilt overwhelms me. It is a burden too heavy to bear. Anybody with me today? You remember those burdens, that guilt of sin, so heavy to bear? It says that he was chastised and given many stri stripes. And, and, and yet that punishment that brought you and I peace. This peace that passes all of sin, this that brought us peace and healing, but it was done because of his stripes. The only way a lawbreaker can be at peace with the law is to suffer the punishment that the law demands. In Jesus, he kept the law perfect. He was perfect. He was sinless. He was flawless. Yet he suffered the whipping that belonged to us. And because he took our place, we now have peace with God and cannot be condemned by God's law. Romans 5, 1 says, therefore, since we've been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of Jesus. It's because of what Jesus has done for us. We couldn't approach the throne, but now because of what Jesus has done, done for us, we can boldly approach the throne. Amen? Amen. That is such good news today. It says in Romans 8, 1, that also there's no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. The healing in Isaiah 53, when he's talking about healing there, he's talking specifically about the forgiveness of sin. Sin is not only like a burden, but sin is also like a sickness that only God can cure. I've been reading this scripture off and on this week. It's Isaiah 118. And it says, come now, let's settle this. Says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet. And scarlet is a stain that does not come out. He says, I will make them as white as snow. Basically, what he's saying is, there's, there's a stain in your life. Anybody ever have some stain on your clothes that you can't get out? <laughs> Spaghetti sauce, right? There are stains that you can't get out no matter how many times you rub them, no matter how much you put on them. I mean, there are stains. But think about this. Though your sins are like scarlet, I will make them as white as snow. God is saying, you can't get rid of your sin. You can't take the sin out of your life. But I can make you as white as snow. And though they are red like crimson, crimson stain, think about that. I will make them as white as wool. Sin is serious. And the prophet calls it transgressions. And what this really means, it means to rebel against God. Rebelling against God. Daring to cross the line that God has drawn. He also calls it iniquities, which refers to the crookedness of our sinful nature. And we're sinners by choice and by nature. Like sheep, we are born with a nature that prompts us to go astray. And like sheep, we foolishly decide to go our own way. So by nature, we are born children of wrath, and, and by choice, we become children of disobedience. But what do we do about all of this? See, under the law of Moses back in here in these prophecies, there were a lot of sheep that would die. They would be sacrificed at the Passover, and, and they, would, they would be die for, for people. They would, they would die for the shepherd. But under grace, guess what happens now? This is what Jesus is. Jesus, the good shepherd, comes and he dies for the sheep. The thief's purpose is to kill and steal and destroy. But Jesus says, my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. And he says, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. And then we move on into 7 through 9. We see this 
silent servant. You know, I think about all the times that Jesus, as you read through the Gospels, how Jesus would appear before the different leaders. And they would accuse him, and they would slap him, and they would spit on him. They would humiliate him. Yet, he was silent. Once again, the prophecy is fulfilled clear back some 700 years before this, when this was written. Here we got Jesus, the silent servant. Now, most people, if you get slapped, you want to slap back, right? Most of us, when, when, when people mouth off, what do we do? We mouth back. But here... We have this silent servant. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth. I mean, I, 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 can, I can think about Jesus coming down that, that Via Della Rosa and I, I can see someone just getting a real, you know, big thing in his mouth, getting ready to spit. You know? And I can see him spitting it and Jesus going with his little pinky like this. Like that. And then going back right in his face. <laughs> you know, that's what I would have done. I mean, I don't want someone doing that to my face. Spitting on me, right? But not Jesus. He's just quiet. Amen. He was oppressed. And he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers. So he did not open his mouth. Why didn't he open his mouth? Well, a servant isn't permitted to talk back. Jesus Christ was treated like a servant. He was silent before those who accused him as well as those who afflicted him. He was silent before Caiaphas. He was he was cited before the chief priests and elders and Pilate, Herod and Tiphys, Tiphys. He did not speak when the soldiers mocked him, when the soldiers beat him. Isaiah 53 says, it says he speaks of his silence under suffering. And in verse 8 of, of Isaiah, he says he was silent when illegally trialed. By the way, illegally trialed. He was illegally trialed and condemned to death. So in today's court, a person can be found guilty of terrible crimes, but if you can be proved that something in trial was illegal, guess what you have to do? You must be tried again. And everything about the trial that Jesus went through was illegal. He knew it, and everybody around him knew it, yet Jesus did not appeal for another trial. Why? John 18, 11 says, The cup which my Father hath given me, shall I not drink it? He knew the plan and the purpose of God. The servant is compared to lamb, which is one of the frequent symbols in the Old Testament of the Savior in Scriptures. A lamb would die for each Jewish household at Passover. And the servant Jesus died for his people. It says in Hebrews 9.22 that without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness. I want you to know today that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 28 times in the book of Revelation Jesus Christ is referred to as the Lamb of God. And since Jesus Christ was crucified with criminals as a criminal, it was logical that his dead body would be left unburied. Anybody go see the uh, Ariah, uh, what's it, <coughs> Risen. Did anybody see that Risen movie? Anybody go see that? Remember where they were, uh, they were in the crucifixion scene and you remember the heap of bodies? It was probably a lot worse than that. But, but basically, that's what would actually happen. The bodies would, would go there. Um, it says in verse 9 that his grave was assigned with wicked men. Yet he was with a rich man in his death because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. 
clear back again another 700 years, this prophecy was fulfilled with Jesus. See, the burial of Jesus Christ is as much a part of the gospel as his death. Think about this. Because without the burial, there is no proof that he actually died. Without the burial, there is no proof. And the Roman authorities would not have released the body of Jesus to Joseph and, and Nicodemus if Jesus had not been dead. It says in John, it says afterward, Joseph of Arimathea, who had been a secret disciple of Jesus because he feared the Jewish leaders, asked Pilate for permission to take down Jesus' body. And when Pilate gave permission, Joseph came and took the body away. With him came Nicodemus, the man who had come to Jesus at night. He brought about 75 pounds of perfumed ointment made, made from myrrh and alloys. And following Jesus' burial custom, they wrapped Jesus' body with spices in long sheets of linen cloth. And the place of crucifixion was near a garden where there was a new tomb never used before. And so, because it was the day of preparation for the Jewish Passover, and since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. How wonderful when you see the prophecies being fulfilled over and over again. And then in closing, in verses 10 through 12, we've got the satisfied servant. It says, but the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hands. And now the prophet Isaiah, he explains the cross from God's point of view. See, even though Jesus was crucified by the hands of wicked men, it was always God's plan. It was always God. His death was determined beforehand by God. By the way, you're not an accident. I want you to know that the same predetermined plan that God had for Jesus also he has for you. That before the foundations were, did you realize this? That God had you in his mind? Isn't that amazing? That you were God's idea in Acts 2, 22, it says this, Men of Israel, I beg you to listen to my words. Jesus of Nazareth was a man proved to you by God himself through the works of power. He proved himself by the miracles and the signs which God showed through him here amongst you, as you very well know. This man who was put into your power by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed him and murdered him. And you used for your purpose men without the law. But God would not allow the bitter pains of death to touch him. Guess what? Jesus is alive. Amen. He raised him to life again. And indeed, there was nothing by which death could hold such a man. Jesus was not a martyr. Nor was his death an accident. He was God's sacrifice for the sins of the world. Where would we be today if we didn't have a Savior that loved us like that? Where would we be today if we didn't have a Savior that loved us enough to die for us? See, in Jesus' resurrection, He triumphed over every enemy and claimed the spoils of victory. Um, if you remember a little bit earlier, um, Satan offered Christ uh, a glorious kingdom uh, in return if, if you would bow down and worship me. Remember in the 40 days. But Jesus knew that that wasn't going to happen because that would mean he would bypass the cross. And Jesus was obedient unto death in God highly exalted him. See, the service work on the cross brought satisfaction. I want you to think about that this morning. 
As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. To begin with, the servant satisfied the heart of the father. John 8, 29 says, I do always those things that please him. And this satisfied God, and he was pleasing to God. And by the way, God did not find enjoyment in seeing his beloved son suffer. But the father was pleased that his son's obedience accomplished the redemption that he had planned from eternity. And that's what he meant when he said, it is finished. Everything that I came to do to pay for the sins of the world, it is finished. See, the death of the servant also satisfies the law of God. God is angry at sin. We need to realize this, that sin offends his holiness. Sin violates his holy law. And in his holiness, he must judge sinners. But in his love, he desires to forgive them. This was a hard message to share with you this morning. I actually wanted to walk away from this message because of the depth that God wanted to reveal to us of what he has done for us and the price that he has paid for us. You know, I, I thought about thinking about three steps to happiness today. What can I do to make people smile? But God kept driving me back to Isaiah over and over because he wants us to know that he paid the price. He paid the price so that you and I could have our sins forgiven. That he wants us to have this right relationship. And, and God, he cannot ignore sin. He cannot co compromise with it. Because that would become true to his nature. See, here's how God solved the problem that we all have. The sin problem. The judge took the place of the criminals. Think about that. The judge took the place of the criminals. Literally, literally, he got off the stand. Think about the judge behind the bench, you know, with the big gavel. He literally got off the stand and took the place of the criminals. And he met the demands of his own holy law. Romans 5, 6 says this, when we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. In Romans 6, 23, it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Grace is love that has paid a price, and we are saved by grace through faith, not of works. I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful that we have a Savior who is worthy of honor and glory and worthy of all of our praise because we will overcome through the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. We will overcome one day. And just as Jesus was resurrected, you and I will have a resurrection day. Don't get too comfortable, people. Don't get too comfortable because this is not your home. We're only, we're only passing through here. Jesus is, is coming back. And the only way for our relationship to be right with Jesus, with, with God is through Jesus. Amen. The only way we're going to have our sins forgiven is through Jesus. Amen. I, I praise God for that. I, I thank God um, that at, at the age of 15, I asked the Lord to forgive me of my sins. I would like to say that I've been perfect ever since. But most of you know that's not the case. 
But I do know this. That at every point in my life after I've been a Christian, there have been times when I've stumbled. And there have been times when I've fallen. But every time, His grace was even more amazing than the first time. That's how much He loves us. Jesus loves us so much that He couldn't bear to live without us. So He came and He died on the cross. He defeated death in the grave and He rose again so that you don't have to fear death and I don't have to fear death. And so that one day I can spend eternity with Him. Amen.